All right, we're going to get underway. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to the Lubar Center at Eckstein Hall, Marquette University Law School. This is On the Issues, and I'm Mike Goucher. This is our uh, continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people who are doing interesting and important work in this region and beyond. Today we are talking about uh, PolitiFact, the uh, largest fact-checking organization in the United States. PolitiFact, very simply, looks at what politicians, elected officials say, and determines if it's accurate or not. Uh, the two people joining us for the conversation are, to my left, Angie Holen. Angie is the national editor of PolitiFact. Uh, she's been with PolitiFact since its inception back in 2007. She was a reporter at the time with the St. Petersburg's Times, and they won a Pulitzer uh, for their 2008 coverage uh, of the campaign cycle that year, the work on PolitiFact. Um, she is now, the, as I mentioned, the, uh, the national editor uh, for PolitiFact. But also joining her today is Tom Kircher, and Tom Kircher is the PolitiFact Wisconsin reporter at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and he looks at what local politicians have to say and whether what they say is true or not. So won't you please welcome Angie Holen and Tom Kircher to Marquette Law School. So one of the things that, that I know Angie feels strongly about, and Tom too, is, is transparency. So we're, we're going to give you all of the facts as we know them about PolitiFact today. So I want to begin, Angie, by talking about how PolitiFact began. I mentioned 2007. Tell us about the origins of PolitiFact. Right. That year, the Tampa Bay Times, then the St. Petersburg Times newspaper, was contemplating its election coverage. 2008 was going to be an interesting year, we knew because President George W. Bush was at the end of his term and his vice president was not running. So we would have wide open primaries for both the Democrats and the Republicans. The Washington bureau chief at the time was Bill Adair, and he wanted to do an innovative way of covering the elections that harnessed the power of the internet. And he also had a personal conviction that American political journalism needed more fact checking. So with other journalists in the Times newsroom, he brainstormed a prototype for a website that became PolitiFact. And the executive editor at the time, Neil Brown, approved the idea. Bill recruited a small team of journalists. I was a reporter on that project. And we started fact-checking uh, the primary campaigns. It caught on. Readers loved it. Thanks to the, the new internet, we could see how many people were reading all of our stories. It wasn't like um, pre-internet days when we put the stories in the newspaper and hoped people would see them. We could see how many people were looking at the stories. And as it took off, we realized this was something that should live beyond just an election year project. And PolitiFact has been going ever since. So its origins, it was newspaper based. Today, who funds PolitiFact? Who works for PolitiFact? How does it work today? Right. PolitiFact lived for years as this section of the newspaper. Um, but all the time, we were developing uh, the journalism and developing a new business model. Today, PolitiFact has, I call it, four buckets of revenue that pay for it. And we are sustainable. The first is online advertising, just like any other news website you see on the internet. PolitiFact has enough traffic that we get revenues from online advertising. Um, the second is syndication and services. We sell our content to um, other news organizations. We do um, specialized fact-checking projects. One of our biggest that we'll probably want to talk about is fact-checking for Facebook. Uh, the third category are grants. We get grants from foundations that are interested in journalism and uh, kind of the, the civic health of the country. All of our grants have clauses that assert our independence, that only PolitiFact journalists determine what we fact check and what the findings are. And then finally, we in recent years, we launched a membership program. We call it the Truth Squad. All the content on PolitiFact is free. Nothing is behind a paywall. But members of the Truth Squad support that with donations. And it's basically 
uh, people who really believe in our mission and want to make sure that we continue it. So today, PolitiFact is an independent nonprofit, is that correct? That's right. Just at the beginning of the year, we moved out from the Tampa Bay Times newspaper to the Pointer Institute, which is an affiliated nonprofit devoted to um, American journalism. So now we're functioning as a, a fully independent nonprofit newsroom, much like ProPublica or the Summer for Public Integrity. We still have our partnerships here in Wisconsin. We partner with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and we have approximately 11 partnerships right now in various states with local journalists who know the, the local markets and do fact checking on the state and local level. Not just newspapers, though. That's the interesting thing. <laughs> when we started, our partnerships were primarily with other newspapers. And, for example, the Austin American Statesman runs PolitiFact Texas. But as the years have gone by, we've expanded partnerships. So today, we are working with nonprofit news sites like Billy Penn in Pennsylvania. And we're also working with NPR affiliates. We run PolitiFact Virginia with the Richmond NPR affiliate and PolitiFact California with the Sacramento NPR affiliate. I'm going to weave Tom into the conversation in a moment. One final question, Angie, before we bring Tom in. And that is the mission as you see it today. What is the mission of PolitiFact in the year 2018? The mission for PolitiFact is what it's always been. It's to give people the information they need to govern themselves in a democracy. We're a website run by journalists and our core ethics are truth, accuracy, transparency, thorough reporting, and clear writing. And our mission is to inform the public. And that's the, really the sole mission. Tom, uh, uh, Angie mentioned that there are local media outlets mm -hmm. that use PolitiFact. The Journal Sentinel uh, is very big on this idea. Describe for us what it is you do at the paper. And this is really what you do full time. This is that's right. your sole, sole objective is to, to look into these kinds of statements. Right. Uh, the Journal Sentinel launched PolitiFact Wisconsin in 2010 in September, just before the race between uh, Scott Walker and Tom Barrett for governor. And we've done, since then, about 1,400 uh, fact checks. Uh, I've been a full-time PolitiFact reporter ever since we launched. And we do have some other contributors as well who write fact checks. Um, I, I want to talk about the rating system, because you're, you're looking at statements that are made uh, largely by politicians, although occasionally it's not a politician. Mm -hmm. uh, you looked at something Kanye West said, uh, which we'll talk about. <laughs> he said a lot. Um, there was a lot of fact checking you could have done there, but Tom isolated right. it to one comment that he made. <laughs> but, but I do want to talk about um, the rating system. So walk through it for people. Many people in the room are familiar, but probably some are not. Either one of you is fine. Go ahead. Go. Yeah? All right. So we have a rating system where we, we evaluate statements that we, first of all, we try to pick a very precise statement to fact check. And it needs to be fact checkable. So it can't be, typically cannot be a prediction or, a, uh, or an opinion. Uh, we go through the process of the research, write the article. Uh, I, as the writer, would recommend how we should rate the statement, but it's actually three editors <laughs> who review the article who discuss what rating to put on that particular statement. You may be familiar with our scale. It ranges from true to mostly true to half true, mostly false, false, and pants on fire. <laughs> pants on fire being not only false, but ridiculous. And we have specific <laughs> definitions for each rating. We're not just sort of spitballing and saying, well, that sounds mostly true or half true. We, we do have definitions for each one. So I, I do want to follow up on that. So you, you said that it's three people who actually come to that right. final decision on right. what we're going to call this after the research has been done, correct? Yeah, and I think that's important. It, it, so it's not just me or, or a single reporter deciding you know, what a rating should be. And in the case of PolitiFact Wisconsin, typically we have one editor of the three who's been involved with the fact check to some extent, so is aware of it when we start on it. Has, has done some editing along the way. Uh, but the other two editors, one may have been partially involved, but typically at least one of the editors is coming in cold. So we've got kind of a range of people involved in terms of how much they know about the fact check before we do a rating. Is that how it works on the national level too? That's exactly how it works at the national level. The, we think the three editors are important so that we have a, a, a variety of of viewpoints looking at the fact check, 
we um, catch small errors in that editing process. Sometimes we'll say, oh, well, you didn't consider this, you didn't consider that. And then finally, we have the discussion about the rating. <coughs> Two votes carry the rating. But the discussion goes something like, mm, I'm not sure if this is mostly true or half true, or is this mostly false or completely false? Um, and we do have the precise definitions um, as Tom mentioned. So like mostly false, the definition would be the statement contains an element of truth but leaves out critical information that would give a very different impression. How do you select, uh, Tom said that you, you look at things that are fact checkable, um, but how do you determine what you're going to be looking at? And I'll, I'll start with Angie and then we'll go back to Tom. What statements do you look at specifically? For PolitiFact National, we look at what topics are in the headlines, and then we look for what people are saying about it. And if something sounds wrong, that certainly attracts us a great deal. Other times, it's just a statement that we think would make the average person say, hmm, I wonder if that's true. We try to fact check a diversity of, uh, of political outlooks. So, but we also have a tendency to fact check people who hold power. So right now, the Republicans hold the presidency in both houses of Congress. We're fact checking the Republicans more, but we do fact check the Democrats as well. When Barack Obama held the presidency and the Democrats held the House, we fact check the Democrats more. Um, we don't try to balance out um, ratings, like if we find a false for one team, we don't go to try and find a false for the other. We just try to um, fact check a diversity of topics and then we let the ratings um, fall where the facts take us. Tom, give us an example of, of uh, a story or of, of uh, a claim, a statement mm -hmm. that you thought met the criteria. Just an example of how you go about this. Well, Mike mentioned Kanye West and even though that's a little bit unusual, we certainly fact check uh, Scott Walker or Tony Evers or others quite a bit more. But he was at the, the White House the other day and talking with the president and happened to make a statement about Foxconn and their plans for you know, thousands of jobs in Wisconsin. So that met several of our criteria in the sense that it was a prominent figure. Uh, uh, is it really true statement? He had said, there are 4,000 jobs, Foxconn jobs in Wisconsin. They're paying $53,000 a year. <laughs> well, gee, is that really true or not? So it, had, it was timely. It was an interesting person. It was an important fact uh, that we wanted to check, and so we decided to jump in. In other cases, as Angie said, you know, we're looking, especially at campaign time, uh, at, at what you would expect, the two big races here in Wisconsin, uh, the governor's race and the U.S. Senate race, and trying to fact check uh, the candidates there as much as we can. And we should say that, that you know, there are, uh, we shouldn't just say it's just limited to um, statements they make, there are also promises they make. Um, that, that uh, political officials make. Um, there are pundits, uh, what pundits say are looked at. So it's, it's a little broader than, than just you know, a statement by a politician or somebody running for office, a little broader than that. Is that correct? That's right. We try to stick with journalism that looks at evidence and makes an evaluation. So with our promise tracking, we uh, follow what uh, for example, President Trump promised during the campaign, and then we look to see whether he achieved it or not. Uh, so that's our that's our promise tracking project. Is and that we, the Trumpometer or is Trumpometer? That, that's yes. right. And we had the Obometer for eight years, which was <laughs> that that worked awesome. really well. The Obometer. That's a that's a good one. <laughs> we have the here in Wisconsin. We have the Waco meter where we've been tracking uh, Governor Walker's campaign promises for. A number of years. Yeah. Right. Okay. But during election time, we tend to focus uh, really on the fact checking. And if you go to the PolitiFact <laughs> site you're going, today, you're going to see fact checks of campaigns around the country, a lot of TV ads. We've been fact checking some mailers, debates. Um, right now, it's it's the heart of election season, and and we're very focused on on uh, the. Contest that will be determined just two weeks from today. How much time, Tom, goes into fact checking? Because I, for example, it's something you did recently. Uh, this is a claim made by the Tony Evers campaign about the governor's stance on pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, as somebody who did a debate the other night, the, the health care issue right. really can get pretty into the weeds pretty quickly right. uh, for people. How much research are you doing to come up with uh, a conclusion to whether something is true or false? 
You know, it really does vary, as you can imagine, depending on the topic and the statement, but it's not uncommon that I'll spend a couple of days uh, on a fact check. So, uh, you know, people might be interested to know, too, that even though I've been doing this now for eight years, you would think maybe you know, it sort of becomes rote in some way, and it really doesn't. It's amazing how many fact checks we launch on and maybe have a sense of, well, that seems true or that seems false, and we get through with the research and discover that you know maybe our initial ideas were wrong. So, yeah. you know, uh, it, the, the the intensiveness of the research is is important. Uh, we want to be able to show people that we've spent quite a bit of time looking at independent sources and experts. And if you notice uh, online, we list all of those people we've spoken to, all the reports we've checked, all the sources we've looked at. And we recognize that people are sometimes going to disagree with the rating that we have, but at least we're, we're honest about, look, here's the statement exactly that we're checking. Here are all the sources we've looked at, and here's how we arrived at our conclusion. When most people disagree with a finding, is it they're disagreeing with the, the research that has been done, or they're just disagreeing with the way you label it, whether you call it mostly false or, you know, uh, pants on fire. Is that where the area of disagreement is most common? At least for people who are reacting to what you do? I find people usually disagree with the rating. Yeah. And it's not our research or if they're, they're, they're not asserting that we need to correct anything. Right. And often they, they say, you got the rating wrong, and then they cite evidence that was in our report. And then they say, and this is why. So um, the ratings uh, are are often a source of controversy, but we also really like the ratings because readers tell us they find the ratings to be an, uh, a compelling way to get into the fact check. So they know where we're coming from as journalists, they know how we see the evidence, and it, it's like a, um, I see it as like a, a, a rating for a movie or a restaurant in that it gives you the gist of where the longer piece is going, but you're, you're still gonna read the longer piece. And I should note, um, for people who, who don't like ratings, factcheck.org is another very reputable fact checker uh, based at University of Pennsylvania, and they don't use ratings. Mm -hmm. So there are different fact checkers in the United States with the different approaches. But at PolitiFact, we have our truth meter and we really like the ratings. Tom, you're on the front lines. What's the feedback? To, to what it is you do. Mm -hmm. What do people tell you? You know, when I decided to apply for the job when the Journal Sentinel launched PolitiFact Wisconsin, I reached out to different PolitiFact reporters around the country, hey, how do you like your job? And it was, consensus was three things. Uh, it's very tough, very difficult work. It's very satisfying work, and you need a thick skin. And I, you know, I think the thick skin part, all three are true, but the thick skin <laughs> is, is certainly part of it. You know, I think we recognize that it's a pretty partisan atmosphere out there, and a lot of people who are criticizing us, in, in effect, are saying, well, you rated my candidate, you gave him a bad rating, you're wrong, you know, with sort of without regard to the facts in our evaluation. And we understand that, and I, and I do think, too, that when people do email, we exchange emails or the occasional phone call, I think after they talk to us and interact with us a little bit, you know, some of the, the temperature goes down, and, and I think they do most of them appreciate what we do. Would you say criticism comes more from Republicans? Does it come more from Democrats? What I've read about PolitiFact, I, I would venture to say that it comes more from conservatives who feel that they are treated more unfairly uh, than uh, Democrats. Um, is that the case? I think that's generally the case. Uh, what, what I noticed is that uh, Republicans and, and conservatives have had a case against the overall media as being liberal, and fact checkers are part of that. So I don't think fact checkers are singled out as, as liberal by conservative critics any more than other members of the media are. Um, Democrats, though, have their problems with us as well because when we rate Democrats as being inaccurate, they say, oh, well, you're just trying to have this false balance to show that you can be tough on Democrats too. So, I mean, in some ways, when people decide they don't like the fact check, they're, they're going to criticize it on some level. My answer, especially um, 
especially to conservative readers, because we've been trying, we've been trying to do more outreach to conservative readers to talk about our methods. We don't want to be fact checkers just for one side of the political spectrum or the other. We do want to be fact checkers for anybody who's interested in learning the facts. Um, my answer to them is that uh, our method is very transparent. We list all of our sources. We outline in our reports everything that we found. And, um, and that because of this transparency, we hope that that eliminates uh, any sort of bias. And certainly, it eliminates any intentional bias. One of the things that I've, I've read uh, in a couple of places, I think there was a professor at the University of Minnesota uh, did a study on political fact, and he said what his conclusion was that the statements that, that Republicans got uh, tougher ratings than Democrats did, and, and, and he was trying to understand why. Was it the material being chosen to fact check that led to that? Uh, do you have any response to that? Um, I, you know, I, I think it's hard to answer that because I don't... I don't see that. When I look at our work, I believe that we're very even-handed. Now, uh, anybody can look at the fact checks that we do, and we're not selecting a random sample. Um, it's not a scientific. Uh, it, it, it's not a scientific sampling. We're picking statements based on their news value, so there is some sub subjectivity there. Um, but I don't. I don't think we lean one way or the other, and. In fact, um, with the President Donald Trump right now, I think even his supporters will concede that he's someone who has a problem with accuracy. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and we, can't, we can't put our thumb on the scale to make two sides look even if they're not. I mean, that would be intellectually dishonest. Tom, give me a sense of, of the kind of, uh, again, talking about this political reaction to it. I, shall, I, I will say this. It, when uh, some folks found out you were going to be doing this event, uh, a Democratic source uh, told me, said, wow, gee, I just, I don't like PolitiFact. I don't like what they've done. You know, they, they fact-checked me, and I didn't think it was right. And they, so there was that Democrat, I mean, you know, it, sometimes it's a nonpartisan thing. Or maybe I should say it's both sides don't like it. Um, but uh, let me get your assessment of that. Do you hear more from uh, uh, Republicans than you do Democrats? I don't. I think it's a pretty equal dislike. Um, you, know. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think people need the readers. Thick skin, Tom. Thick well, skin. yeah, you know, the, right. <laughs> you know, politicians and readers need to understand that, that people are different, right? So one candidate maybe is out there more, speaking publicly more than the other. One might be have TV ads more than another. Uh, generally speaking, a challenger running against an incumbent might be making more statements that are maybe a little more out there, a little more inflammatory. So, you know, when we're going about picking statements, as Andrew said, we're not trying to put our thumbs on the scale or make things equal. We have to react to what we have. You know, right now we've got the governor's race and the Senate race, and the candidates uh, speak out on different issues in different ways. And so, you know, depending on what they say and how they say it and how often they say it and how important the issues are, that's how we choose what to check. How challenging is it uh, doing the kind of work we've been talking about in an age where the news moves so quickly, the news cycle is so rapid now, and you're trying to spend time digging into something, making sure you've looked at it completely, thoroughly, before you say whether it's true or false. Sure. Uh, how, how hard is it to stay current, to not become dated, given the way the news moves in today's world? It's a huge challenge, and it's something we wrestle with at PolitiFact. I do think that we see our role as being a little bit behind the news cycle, because we're looking at what people say, and then we're fact-checking them. Um, so we never want to rush our research. Um, even when we have a good handle on, on what's being said, it takes us a while to prepare the reports. So I think in some ways we just have to accept that fact-checking is a, is a bit of a slow journalism. I would say that the news cycle, though, is so quick and so fast, especially on cable TV, that it's, it's starting to diminish um, the richness of the reporting and the journalism. And I don't think people, if they're just following the 24-hour news cycle, I don't think they're getting a full sense of the news and the complexity of the issues that we're facing as a country and, as a, uh, and even internationally. 
Tom, we see this in, in local races. We see it in the race for governor. I mean, huh. there are things said on a daily basis that I'm sure you go, wow, mm -hmm. I'd like to look at that. Um, how challenging is it to, to be able to do that and still keep things current, still keep it, uh, you know, of interest to the, sure. to the rear? You know, there's a real tension there. I think, you know, we're web-based. We want to be as responsive and as quick as we possibly can. But, you know, we're fact-checking. We're not, we're not trying to do drive-by fact-checks. We're trying to do something that has some substance to it. So there is that constant tension, I think, of trying to jump on something as quickly as we can and to turn around to fact-check as quickly as we can but the quality still is first. No, sometimes yeah. we look really quick, and these would be on debate nights or political speeches. And in those cases, we are helped by the fact that politicians tend to repeat themselves. So thankfully, really? we, <laughs> we, can, we can fact check what looks like we're fact checking in real time because we're drawing on the fact checks that we did previously at a more normal pace. So let's talk about fact checking in a world where facts now are often in dispute. Um, uh, well, it's true. It's uh, it's the world we live in. And, and so, you know, as I was preparing for this, I was remember. You know, I started to remember. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's comment about people who are entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And yet, I think in today's world, there's some of that that people do think they're entitled. How does PolitiFact? Um, exist in a world where we are very tribal, where we may see where we have actually cable news networks at night that, that may cherry pick facts to support a narrative, to support a worldview. Mm -hmm. How challenging is it for you to exist in that world today? It is challenging. And I have to say in the 11 years that we've been fact checking, it seems that the environment has become more partisan and more knee jerk. And I think at PolitiFact, we have accepted that we're going to be out of step in that sort of environment, and we're going to take a lot of incoming criticism, um, but we're going to keep doing it because it's the kind of journalism that we started with and because we ha believe we have an audience that really cares. I, definitely, the PolitiFact audience is people who are very interested in the news, very interested in politics, but also really want to know the facts and the truth behind these these weighty topics. Now, that's not everybody on Twitter by any means. <laughs> so, it, so we are we are part of this environment right now that isn't exactly friendly to fact checking. Mm -hmm. It can be discouraging at times when you're out there and people will say, "Gee, why do you guys bother?" There's there's so much so many false statements being made all the time, and you guys are out there with sort of this lone voice, but. Uh, you know, we just keep at it. What else, what else would we do? We just want to let it, let it all go? No, we want to try to check as much as we can. Um, there's a guy who works at Marquette, a Pulitzer Prize winner, he used to be a, mm -hmm. a PolitiFact partner of mine. Dave Umhafer. Dave Umhafer, right? and he used to say, it's honest work. And, and that's you know, what I believe, too, is that we're out there each day recognizing we're going to be the brunt of attacks at some point in criticism, but we're doing an honest job to try to present the facts as best we can, and that's, that's satisfying work. And I very much believe PolitiFact is putting down a marker for how this sort of journalism is done and that it should be done on an ongoing basis. Um, for example, we were fact-checking for years before Donald Trump came along. Other news organizations would sometimes refer to our reports, um, but they weren't doing that much fact-checking of their own. Well, when Donald Trump started in the Republican primary where he was debating with other Republicans, it just became immediately obvious that there was a need for fact-checking. And we saw so many other news organizations start doing their own fact-checking, and that was really gratifying. And they uh, imitated some of our methods that we've set out. And I think that um, we're going to see fact-checking now as a permanent part of American journalism. So I'm really heartened when I see uh, other news organizations doing fact checking, and I hope they continue to. Does it evolve in any way? Uh, and if it were to evolve, what would that look like? Our fact checking methodology at PolitiFact does not particularly evolve because it's so based on research, evidence, verifiable facts, very old methods of, uh, of verification. Does technology help with that, though? 
Um, the, the innovation yeah. in technology is, is distribution. It's like, how do we get fact checks to people? How do we get it to them in a format that they uh, will appreciate and engage in? We're doing more video. Um, we've experimented over the years with apps and podcasts. Um, one of our most robust methods for reaching readers is we have a free weekly email that people can sign up for on our website. I write the email every week. And it's, it's old fashioned, but it, it seems to work. But, but we are always looking for new ways um, uh, to get in front of people. I should mention the Facebook partnership. Yeah. Facebook Please. approached us after the 2016 election. Uh, the PolitiFact and a number of other third party fact checkers, such as factcheck.org, mm -hmm. and asked us if we would start fact checking content on their site and marking it on their site. And Facebook's idea is it wants to teach its algorithms to recognize hoaxes and conspiracy theories so that it can downgrade that sort of material on the Facebook news feed. And it, it's a, been a fascinating program to take part in, and it's still ongoing right now. What have you seen? What can uh, you share with us? Well, Because uh, <laughs> that is a fascinating discussion. It really is. Yeah, I mean, like, we see all, all kinds of wild fake news, like... Um, Barack Obama put his face on the one dollar bill would be one. Um, we saw we saw a post recently about Canada um, legalizing marijuana and then uh, all of the donut shops in the country having a run on them and they ran out of donuts. So some of it is like some of it is silly, some of it is conspiratorial. Um, uh, but it's like it's like we we work with Facebook. It's like the worst news feed you've ever seen because Facebook shows us um, posts that users have flagged or that its algorithms have detected, and uh, and a lot of them are are highly dubious. Is this done at a local <laughs> level of all time, or or is this something that's more on the national scale? It really is, yeah, yeah more national. Um, you know, and just to your point about whether methods have evolved, I would agree with Angie that our standards and our the way we fact check is the same. I, I will say the, the longer I've done it, the more I've gone to longer interviews to look for fact checks. So we're checking lots of different sources. What do people say on Facebook? What do the politicians say in their TV ads or on Twitter? But I find that if I, I go to interview shows like, like Mike's on Sunday or other radio talk shows, because I feel like then I'm getting the full context of what a person is saying as opposed to you know, a, a tweet or a soundbite. I, I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about s sort of the, the outreach that you're doing today. So you're here with us. Um, tonight you'll be at a coffee shop in, in the Walkers Point neighborhood uh, talking about some of these same things. I saw, Angie, that uh, you, you've been all over the country uh, talking about PolitiFact. You've been to, to Tulsa and to Charleston, West Virginia, and Mobile, Alabama. Yeah. Um, what kinds of conversations are you having with folks? Yeah, the, the trip to... Um Tulsa, Charleston, and Mobile was really interesting because um, it's there. A lot of people who believe in independent journalism are concerned about the partisanship, and they're very concerned about public polling that shows conservatives and Republicans have very high levels of distrust in the independent media. So there's some thought of like, how can we address this? And so Politifact put together a proposal to visit. Um, Trump cities just to talk about fact checking and how we do our how we do our work and the visits were were really positive because what I find is that once we get off the internet and we get face to face with people um, th there's just a lot more productive conversations like um, you know the the conservative readers would say well we think you should be fact checking this or we think you should look more closely at this. And we would explain our methods, like we're not just slapping ratings on things, we're doing this research, we have this editing method. And um, it, it, really, it really was um, positive. Now that's a difficult project to scale mm -hmm. up. Um, but it does, it does lead me to some conclusions that I think, I think people are less partisan um, than we think when we get in person. I think these in-person conversations are so critical. Yep. Um, things online just seem so tense and so inflammatory, um, but I'm not sure that that is fully reflective of our day-to-day -day lives. You're nodding in agreement, Tom. 
Yeah, I think that's right. I mentioned earlier that when people do call or email, they might be sort of on fire when they first make contact and criticize. But I think once there's a, an interaction or a conversation, uh, you know, their temperature goes down. And uh, you know, I don't know if this sounds cliche, but you know, as journalists, we're kind of wired differently than, than a lot of other people. We're taught from journalism school on to, you know, we want to learn about the world, explain the world, provide the facts. We don't have a dog in the fight like a lot of partisans do when it comes to, you know, politics and campaigns. So I sometimes people need to be reminded of that, that, that we really are after accuracy and the truth and we're not on one side or another. Yeah, and I should emphasize, this isn't to say PolitiFact is always right and the complainers are always wrong. That's certainly not true. We do try to correct our errors promptly whenever they're errors, but sometimes they're just differences in outlook or approach. And in, and in those cases, I think a, a, a dialogue or a conversation is, is what we want, whereas sometimes like people will come at us and, and say like, you know, you, either you're incompetent or you hate America or, and it's like, that's, it's very hard to have a, an illuminating dialogue when it starts like that. But, but even then, sometimes it's possible. You raise an interesting point, though. Are there certain things when you get into them, you go, I, I don't know that this is factually knowable, that maybe this is a worldview thing, and maybe this is just not a, a good a fact-checking opportunity for us. Do you ever have those moments? We do, and we have a couple of different approaches. Sometimes we say, we're not gonna write about this, and we just move on. Mm -hmm. Other times, we just try to put together some findings as best we can, and we don't rate it. We just, mm -hmm. we post it as a story. We say why we couldn't fact-check it. And then I have to say some of those uh, uh, kinds of examples fall into the half-true bucket, <laughs> which uh, our readers are, um, often tell us they don't like the half true rating, but sometimes I just feel like there's no other really tenable rating for a, a statement that it's partially accurate but leaves out important context. Have you worked on those, Tom, where you, you get into it and you say, I, I just, we're not going to come up with a rating on this, right. but we are going to present the information. Right. We, we do that as well. We will look at something and decide. Wasn't the Kanye West one? Uh, we did rate, rate him that half, half true. true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there are those cases where you get into it and you realize, boy, this is not going to be fact checkable, yet it's an issue that you know, is important to people and we can illuminate it by doing an article and leaving off the rating. So the two of you, uh, when you try to check something out, you're looking at a lot of different sources. And I get this question a lot when I'm out. People in this room will say, if I want to be well informed, uh, where do I go? Where do I go for information that I can believe, that I can trust? Do you have suggestions for, for people as media consumers, uh, besides PolitiFact, I'm sure you'd say, but, but are there other places uh, where they can go, where they can feel, you know, the, the, the information I'm getting is true and real? My recommendations are generally for people to um, turn to the newspapers. I still feel that the newspapers are some of the best sources of information, certainly the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel here. Um, nationally, I would encourage people to read one of four newspapers, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, or USA Today. All of those are newspapers that have excellent news standards. And if, if you are, have a political point of view, the Wall Street Journal editorial page is conservative, and the New York Times is liberal. Um, on television, I'm a huge fan of the PBS NewsHour. And I DVR that and watch it regularly. Um, it's not as snazzy and fast Very paced traditional as, presentation. Yeah, yeah. as cable mm. TV. Um, but it's a wonderful news report. They do great international news, and I find them to be very thoughtful. I think NPR still does a lot of great work. Um, what I encourage people is to find a news source that they believe is credible, has high news standards, and to engage with it regularly and not just wait for the news to come to you. Because if you, I just don't see that people can be well informed if they're just waiting for things to come to them through social media or TVs that they see out of the corner of their eye. I think in today's world, it just demands a much higher level of engagement from people to be informed. Mm -hmm. Tom? I just look for confirmation. You know, if there are things in your, your news feed, if you will, that are not traditional news media sources, and you see something that catches your attention, you know, before you share it on Facebook or tell your friends about it, you know, look for some confirmation. Do a quick Google search. Is what I just read being reported anywhere else by credible sources? 
I'm going to take a few questions from the audience here in just a moment. I, I did want to conclude by talking about something that's probably one of the most popular features of PolitiFact, and that is their biggest lie of the year award. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I, I want to talk about a couple of them in particular. Um, I think in, well, in 2013, I, I think President Obama got the biggest lie of the year award. It was about health care. Right. Let's talk about that for a moment. How did you determine that what he said about health care would be the biggest lie? Well, what we pick the, the lie of the year every year in December, and we're looking for the the falsehood or inaccurate statement that had the most impact, that we think was the most significant. And we write a a fairly lengthy story about why we think it was most significant. The year that Barack Obama won, it was for his claim, if you like your health care, you can keep it. Now that was a, an unusual statement for us because it was something that he campaigned on um, before the health care law was drafted or signed into law. So uh, when he started saying it, it seemed like a fairly accurate summation of his plan. Now, this is where we get into the healthcare weeds. He didn't have an individual mandate as part of his plan that hadn't been written. Um, where, when it became inaccurate was after the law had passed and the Department of Health and Human Services started drafting regulations that meant some people would lose their plans. So um, it, it was a statement that never got an absolute false rating for it from us because so many people were able to keep their plans, but some weren't. Nevertheless, it was a huge um, talking point that, that proved wrong for millions of Americans. Not everybody, but some of them. And so we did select it as our lie of the year. And we heard from a lot of Democrats who said they felt like it was unfair because it wasn't um, an absolutely false statement in every case. It was true for a lot of people. And we heard from a lot of Republicans who said we'd been too soft on Obama all along and this showed how we were terrible. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it was, a, it was a good one to pick. Fast forward to 2017, a statement by President Trump about the, the Russian influence on the 2016 election. What did he say and why did you give him the, the honor? <laughs> yes, this My choice picked, of words, I guess. We picked you know. at the end of 2017 when there was so much discussion about Russian influence on the election. Uh, I think today most people accept that Russia did mount an influence campaign in the 2016 election, um, trying to create division among Americans on hot button social issues and trying to put out information that would favor Donald Trump and diminish Hillary Clinton. Um, I think that um, Vladimir Putin, uh, from our research, had a, had a really did not want Hillary Clinton to win. And I would say more than he wanted Trump to win. He didn't want Clinton to win. Um, but in 2017, Trump kept saying, Russian, Russian meddling is a hoax. Russian, uh, this isn't real. I went fair and square. Nobody interfered. And we selected that as lie of the year. Now, what's been interesting is that um, uh, Trump has seemed to have just very quietly just dropped that line from his vocabulary, and now he keeps saying there was no collusion, there was no collusion. Maybe Russia was doing something, but we didn't, um, we didn't uh, help them. That is, is something that I don't think we could fact check. It's something, that's, the, that's essentially the subject of the Mueller investigation. Um, I think with the indictments of Russians, there's definitely, um, our reporting has proved I think our lie of the year has proved accurate because there was Russia interference in the election. Um, whether the Trump campaign worked with them or helped them, I think we still have yet to find out. I should know this, but I don't, Tom. Is there a local equivalent? Uh, to there's you? not. No, there's we, not. We just, have you thought about that? Bird to national on that one. Uh, a, a local <laughs> politicians who lie was the whopper of the year. Is that? Uh, uh, we just haven't done it, and I'm, I'm not sure that we will. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's some of our every year we do the lie of the year, and it was it was kind of our take on Tom's person of the year. Um, and we hear from readers who are like, you know, this is too mean, we don't like this, but we also hear from readers who love it, and we have a reader's poll where we have people vote on what they think would be the biggest falsehood of the year, and um, we'll be unveiling a reader's poll in a few weeks, so people will be able to weigh in after the election. <coughs> Well, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, those of you who've joined us in the past know how this works. If you're in the seating bowl down here, press on the black uh, uh, thing in front of you. 
How's that for a good way of describing it? <laughs> that black thing in front of you, press down on that. Uh, Ryan will also try to amplify your, your questions. If you are in the back and you have a question, Ryan has a microphone, he will hold it and will ask you to hold your questions to a fairly brief time so we can get to as many as possible. You seem very eager, so we're going to, to let you ask the first question. On this, but I'm wondering if there's you keep a running total of how many uh, the ratings for of the New York Times versus the Wall Street Journal versus other magazine, newspapers and TV things. I mean, do you, you know, does the New York Times have 50 lies in a month? That well, Wall I think Street they're, they're rating politicians, but politicians say they're not rating I, the newspapers. Yeah, I understand you know. that, but yeah. I just wondered if on the side you keep track of the media itself. Yeah. Our fact-checking website is set up as a database, so you can look up a person's page, like you can go to Donald Trump's page and see how many times we've fact-checked him and how the ratings have, <coughs> have fallen out. Um, so we do have that, and a lot of people like that, to see how, um, how different politicians have been rated over time. Do you have a question over there? Yeah, hang on a second, we'll bring you the microphone. Hang on, up here first. <laughs> Thank you. Have you ever retracted a rating after or in light of facts that came to you after your report? Yes, we have. We have a corrections policy, and um, from, from time to time, it's been very rare, we have retracted ratings because um, we either got additional information or... Um, uh, usually we retract ratings because like we missed something in the reporting process. Thankfully, it doesn't happen very often. We mark our corrections so that people can see them and we archive the old version. Ever have to you, Tom? Or you're flawless? <laughs> <laughs> I'll say flawless, but no. Uh, just one point on that. I think people need to understand too that when we fact check a statement, it's based on what information was available, was knowable at the time that the statement was made. So something could change, a story could evolve, a, a rating could change because of Well, this. we wouldn't change a rating because new information comes out, but we, so, you know, a person will jump on me occasionally and say, well, you rated this false, but look what happened last week, this, mm -hmm. this new information came out. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't use information that emerged today to fact check a statement that was made a month ago, so. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I'm going to go here, and then I'll come down here. Yes, sir. I was going to say about the, the bias in the media, uh, you know, the conservatives not trusting the media. You know, when you look back at, let's say, Dan, uh, Dan Quayle, the media constantly, all the man did was spell potato wrong. And I was a younger man at the time, and I thought to him, why are you going so visceral on this man for destroying potato? And, and night after night after night, because he spelt the word potato wrong. Therefore, how can he be competent? But when you look in the dictionary, there's two words that are acceptable, the old English potato and the new, you know, new English potato. They're both okay, but they eviscerated him night after night. Or even now, when you look at the mainstream media on a national level, giving the debate questions to Hillary Clinton before the debate, that was reported in Time magazine. You know, and, and so the, you know, the perception is not exactly mythological. I, mean, I think this gets at uh, sort of uh, something we touched on, and this is this, this skepticism or suspicion right. of the motives of mainstream media. Yeah, I think um, I, I think people look at the media and 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 they often have complaints like that. Um, you know, the counterpoint for Dan Quayle would be uh, many Democrats feel that the media was extremely unfair to Al Gore when he ran for president in 2000, and they said he sighed too much, and he wore the wrong color clothes. So, I mean, I see lots of, I see lots of complaints against the media for stories um, where people feel like the media had the wrong lens, or the wrong outlook, or they put too much emphasis. Um, and and those, those are the kind of complaints that I think are the hardest to address, because um, they go, there's so much in, um, there's so much in nuance and, and, and uh, how much coverage does something deserve? Mm -hmm. And those can be hard questions for experienced journalists and for everyday people to answer. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, just keep your finger down on it. 
Yep. Oh, there I see. Um, how do you relate to or compare yourself to Snopes, or don't you acknowledge them? Oh, it's, so yeah. Did you hear the question? Yeah. Okay, how do you compare yourself to Snopes, and I'll let you yeah. explain Snopes to the audience. Snopes audiences. is, um, I would definitely consider Snopes uh, one of our colleagues in the fact-checking movement. Snopes is a website that started off focusing on what they called urban folklore. So, like, one of my favorite ones is that they debunked, and it's not true, is that Mikey, the kid from the Life Cereal commercial, died after he ate Pop Rocks and drank a Coke. So, Snopes would fact check. That's not true. No, it's not true. <laughs> yeah. And um, S Snopes has expanded over the years from that kind of um, pop culture stuff to now they do all sorts of fact checking and they're involved in the Facebook project. Now, Snopes um, is not, um, they basically started as an internet project of a couple based in California. They weren't, um, they, they weren't trained journalists. So they have a little bit of a different outlook and a different, um, I don't know, kind of a different feel to their website than PolitiFact. Um, but I, I think they're, I think they do interesting work, and we certainly look at their fact checks and sometimes refer to them. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to go up to the back of the room, make sure I get somebody up there first. I'm going to get that gentleman right there, right there. Yeah. Um, two two quick questions. One is there a. Uh, the source where we can see a list of the, your fact-checking colleagues in different, like Snope and so forth? And, and secondly, do you, do you have a, a feeling of achievement? Do you, do you, can you give an example of when you've changed the conversation in one of your fact-checks? Oh, that's a great question. For other fact-checking sites, if you go to the PolitiFact homepage, we have a, 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 a section on the right hand called Fact-Checking Around the Web where we link to other fact checkers that we consider reputable. There's also an international fact checking network housed at the Pointer Institute that will take you to links to other fact checkers around the world. Um, now, uh, the question was about when has our fact checking changed the conversation? Um, it can be very hard to measure that. I, I will say that some of the fact checking uh, that I that when I think we really were influencing the conversation was during um, the drafting of the healthcare legislation, because there was a lot of misinformation going on about um, the healthcare legislation. It was complicated legislation to explain, just to, to have people understand. Um, so I think, I think a lot of the work we did then um, was really strong work because a lot of people really didn't even understand how the current healthcare system worked. And some of the fact checks were really long because it's like, <laughs> to explain how the law is changing yeah. things, I have to explain to you first how everything works now. And it, it's just complicated stuff. An example, Tom? We do, uh, from time to time, we'll hear a, a politician giving a speech and pausing at one moment and saying, go ahead and fact check that or, or or don't pull it effect that. <laughs> and so, you know, we know we're at least sort of on the radar, and, and we'll notice sometimes that uh, campaign ads will change, a statement will be made in one campaign ad, uh, we'll give it a rating of false or mostly false, and that uh, the wording in the next ad will be a little bit different. Uh, so, you know, we do notice those things, but I should also say, you know, our mission is not to change behavior. We're not out there to try to stop people from saying things that are wrong. We're out there to serve leaders. Sorry. Did you have a question right there? Police press down on that, yeah. Thank you. Are there any examples where your fact checked may have strongly or even changed the results of an election? The outcome of an election? The outcome of an election. I don't I don't That would be hard to know, wouldn't it? I I, I can't know. think of one and I'm <laughs> Yeah, and it would be really hard to know. I mean, one thing that I will tell you is that my experience fact-checking elections is that people care about whether the polit what the candidates say is true or not. I think they do care, but it's not the only criteria that they use. So they will also consider their own political philosophy. They'll consider um, the personalities of the candidates. They'll consider specific issues that they really care about. I think sometimes when the topic of conversation is fact checking, we it's it's we have to be careful not to to think that 
that fact checking is the is the most important criteria out there. Sometimes people make factual mistakes, but they still have good ideas, mm -hmm. or they're completely accurate, but they have bad ideas. I mean, it, it really just depends. And I don't think voters. I think when voters go into the voting booth and pull the lever for someone, there's so many there's so many different things going on, including like tribal loyalty. Do they consider themselves a Democrat or a Republican? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think that, um, I don't think that fact checking necessarily, um, well, it definitely can't overcome some of those strong uh, feelings one way or the other. I was gonna say though, Tom, I mean, there are, um, you will often put down a whole list of statements made by a, a public official to fact check what they've said over a period of time. I suppose in, in some way that, that can be helpful or not helpful to a person making a decision on who they're going to vote for. Could you say it swung an election? No, right. but it certainly could be used to be make an informed decision at the polling place. Yeah, I think that's right. I think there are voters out there who wanna know, is this person you know, generally honest, or, or that statement that I heard on TV, is that correct? Uh, you know, people should remember, though, too, that we're not fact-checking every utterance of every politician, so you can't go to our website and say, you know, so-and-so is wrong 75% of the time. Uh, you know, we're limited to, to what we're actually, statements that we're checking, and certainly not everything a person says. Let me do uh, just a couple more, and then we'll wrap things up, yes. Um, how do we... Other than checking our own stuff, when we get stuff in, checking before we send it out, do we contact you and say, hey, I've got something over here you might want to look at? Kind of like a citizen reporter, but a citizen fact checker putting you into something? Send an email to politifact at journalsentinel.com. And you know, we really do appreciate suggestions. Absolutely. True. OK. Um, other quick questions right there? Yes, you hang on a second. What is the 2018 lie of the year? Uh, <laughs> still many more months to go. <laughs> yeah. I, what do, you, do you have a candidate? That's, you know. It may not have been uttered yet. We'll see. We'll How, when see. do you make that decision? Um, we're actually going to have a meeting in a couple of weeks to try and come up with our reader ballot, like okay. so the top ten potential lies of the year, and um, and then we'll make a decision. All right. Uh, let's see. One there, and then I think we're going to wrap things up. Yeah. I'll get to you next. Time. Do you do you warn people about Wikipedia? Let's say again. Do you warn people about Wikipedia, or would you warn people? Uh, Wikipedia is a fascinating example. Um, I tell the re reporters, like, when you start your research, it's okay to look at Wikipedia at the beginning, but you never want to stop there. And I think most people understand that Wikipedia's value is in its citations. It sends people to other sources um, where they can uh, get accurate information. It could be particularly good for biographical information, for example, on a person, especially if that person hasn't emerged and is, is in a household name. Uh, but right, we, we look for the citations in Wikipedia. We don't cite Wikipedia, Wikipedia as, as a source. Yeah. All right, time for one more. If you can make a brief, yep, hang on. I think one of Mike's questions was too polite, and I find him too polite once in a while. The question really is, which side makes more outrageous uh, statements? And could you please have a meter or a list and just say which side? And, and I think that's why it looks like it, what you're doing is biased. But it just so happens, I think, one side makes more outrageous statements than the other side. That shocks me that you think yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, just based on your past presence, that just shocks me. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that he asked that of Angie. <laughs> <laughs> There's really not an answer to that. Yeah, I mean, I never know what to say to that um, comment. But I will say this. I don't think that accuracy or truthfulness is the, the, uh, the purview of any one party or candidate. Um, and it, like the, the example that I often use is... Um, Governor Jeb Bush, former Governor Jeb Bush of Florida. He's very familiar with PolitiFact because PolitiFact started in Florida. And um, he's a conservative, 
Um, and his ratings are very positive. He, he is not someone who makes a lot of inaccurate statements because, um, so like whenever someone's like, well, doesn't Donald Trump show that Republicans have a problem with accuracy? I will say, well, Jeb Bush shows that they don't. And a lot of times I find it's the individual candidate and how much they care about truthfulness or accuracy that determines um, their truthometer rating. I'm going to wrap things up uh, right there. Um, I did want to mention, if you want to continue this conversation, you'd like to hear more from our guests tonight. Uh, Greg Borowski seated down here. What time does this begin, and where is it, Greg? Six o'clock, uh, Anodyne and Walker's Point. Okay. Six o'clock at Anodyne Coffee Shop in Walker's Point. It's at Bruce and Second, did you say, or somewhere around there, yeah. Um, you can hear more of the conversation if you'd like. Uh, having said that, though, uh, thanks very much for your time, your interest, your attention today. We're delighted to have you with us and to, to listen to our guests. Please, again, give a nice round of applause to Angie Holen and Tom Kirchner. Thank you. Very much.